Hey everyone, welcome to Group Text. My guest today is Skeet Ulrich, who has played his fair share of baddies in both TV and films such as The Craft, As Good As It Gets, and Riverdale, as well as being the OG original Ghostface. Billy Loomis in the first Scream movie back in, ooh, makes me feel old, 1996. Oh, Skeet is currently starring along one of my favorite human beings, Giancarlo Esposito in Parish, with new episodes every Sunday at 9, 8 central on AMC. He plays Colin, an ex-con trying to set his life straight in the gritty criminal underworld of New Orleans. Skeet, welcome to uh, Group Text. Hi, thank you. <laughs> I do feel more accomplished. Uh, it's amazing when you read someone's intro, even when that happens to me, you suddenly feel like, wow, I'm not really the degenerate loser I think I am. I know. And you and Giancarlo, come on. If you're mentioned in a sentence with that man, you're doing something right. So by the way, is he not one of the nicest human beings alive? I think he I think he actually is the nicest. Um I, I've whole... yeah, I've never had like a bad interaction with him ever no you know he's so present and it's and he just gives you his full attention so and his intention is all or his attention is always positive so it's yeah he lights up a room we're gonna talk about parish in a minute but i have to ask about your name and i'm sure you are so sick of being asked Mm. brian ray trout but you go by yeah yeah Explain for people how you got that name. Uh, well, my, you know, really within a year, but or maybe less, maybe like six months, both of my names changed. Um, my mom had remarried to DK Ulrich. Um, my brother says Ulrich, by the way, uh, being our stepdad. And so we, I don't know. He says people spell it correctly if he says it that way. I say the opposite. I say they spell it correctly if I blah, blah, blah. Anyway, Um, by the way, we had to look this up and I got both because I always said Ulrich, but online they say Ulrich. Right. Yeah. 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 It's a joke inside my brother and I, like and his kids and my kids will have like, you know, get togethers and stuff and we'll have the Ulrichs versus the Ulriches, you know, in games and stuff. So, um, but that's how my last name changed uh, through my first stepdad and him adopting my brother and I and when we were 10 and then I was in this small town Concord North Carolina and um playing baseball and this coach said I was small and fast and he was going to call me Skeeter because I look like a mosquito flying around the outfield and it just stuck everybody called me that you know it was the team and then the school and family and to the point my grandfather was the last one to call me Brian and that's been he passed God, over 10 years ago. Well, I was going to say, does anyone call you Brian anymore? Because I know for me, <laughs> sorry, I was going to ask if anyone called you Brian anymore because for me, no one calls me Missy. Uh, my yeah. friends call me Mel or Melissa. Very few call me Melissa, but most call me Mel. The only people left calling me Missy are my parents' friends. Yeah. And they're dropping like flies. So I think there's only two left that call me Missy. It's weird. (laughs) Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, I don't know. It's a why, you know, and I mean, the name has changed (laughs) since, you know, the Urban Dictionary changed its meaning or created a meaning or however that evolved, whether it's Little John or whoever. Uh, but yeah, that's how it happened. Um, and you know, by the time I got to NYU and was doing plays and being asked, you know, what I wanted on the playbill, well, I'm, I'm, it was a no, everybody calls me Skeet. Why would I say Brian? Like, so, you know, and I didn't think like, oh, one day on the screen, you know, it's going to say, I didn't never cross my mind. You know, I just, that's what I was called and that's what we put in the playbill. And then can't veer off course mid, you know, and go, oh, yes, I think Brian would be a much better, you know, screen name or whatever. I don't know. So you just brought up NYU and something I found fascinating when we were doing our research was you were discovered by David Mamet. Yes and no. I mean, yes and no, in the sense that his program, certainly, you know, I, I, it was a, 
interesting time where I I knew coming from North Carolina that and with very little experience, there was probably no way I could audition my way into NYU. And I stumbled upon this brochure about Mamet's program and I went to their summer thing and then to get into his NYU program, which was they accepted like 15, 16 people. You had to answer 10 questions and as this was pre-internet so and they were obscure so I spent the better part of two three weeks in the library at UNCW where I was going to school um, researching what these answers could be and then you know I got to the next step step having answered those questions which was come to New York do an interview not with him not with you know it was um, with great people, by the way, who now run the Atlantic Theater Department in New York, um, Neil Pepe and Mary McCann. You know, you do this, you know, this in-person interview and they ask you about the global. The point of the questions was, in Mamet's mind, is that if you had the willpower to seek those answers, you had the willpower required to be in his class. And and so that's how I got in. I, I didn't really meet him until, you know, until school started. But um, so it's yeah, I know that that's out there in the literature that he discovered me. It wasn't really sort of like that. He was a teacher at the school that included many, many really brilliant minds. William H. Macy was a teacher. Uh, Liz Himmelstein, who's one of the foremost dialect and voice teachers on the planet, was our voice teacher at the time. So he just had surrounded us with incredible people to uh, help us be better actors. Um, I, for people who don't know, David Mamet is one of the most significant playwrights of, what do you think, the last 40 years? Yeah, I mean, he's got, what, four Pulitzers at last count, if not more yeah. at this point? I mean, he's a really incredible, incredible mind. And, uh, and you know, he's, yeah, he's an auteur of, of dialogue, of how people talk, you know, and... And, you know, he's, uh, I guess he's, you know, he's a lot of things. He's kind of a drill sergeant. He's kind of a, but he set this work ethic in this, this space around the theater that, you know, at that time, like you could fail, you could, you know, you, you didn't have to go out and be Brad Pitt from the first line you uttered, you know, you were there. They didn't allow you to audition. You were there to learn and roll around on the floor and moan and do all the different things that, you know, you do in, in opening yourself up to parts the, as, so it was an incredible time. I mean, really, uh, you know, so formative for me, but his work ethic was you, you're 15 minutes early or you're late. And if you're late, you're not allowed in. And you take that 15 minutes to gather your senses. You know, you're in Manhattan. You got, it takes a little bit to calm down coming off the streets and get your head around what it is you're doing that day and all that stuff. And he really wanted you to, to take that time, you know, and, and for respect for yourself, for the theater, for your, your coworkers, you know, all that. And, and I mean, it's something that I hold dear to this day. I'm never late. Oh, that's a that's amazing coming from a producer's point of view. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, professionalism counts, you know. Like, and you know, you and it's same in scenes, you know. Like, if if somebody shows up and they're not really prepared, like it makes your job harder because they're going to use the one that they got right. So you got to be on every moment, you know. You got to be, and it's frustrating. It's you know, and. I remember working with John Wells and he was one of the first, uh, Ang Lee sort of had this unspoken thing about you don't bring scripts to my set. Like you don't bring sides to my set. And John Wells has the same thing. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that do. And for those of us who are lifers that have done for, we would never think to, like we're there to prepare and work. Sometimes you'll bring notes, you know, and stuff, but like to come in, not knowing your scenes is, it's like a singer getting on stage and they don't know the lines to the song. I studied with Sandy Meisner. Oh, there you go. For a couple of, I left eventually uh, in the second year because I started working. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it was the same thing. It yeah, was, he taught it mammoth. He was yeah. mammoth teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And the knock at the door. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it, that stays with you. Um, there were a bunch of things that I didn't know 
which you're probably so sick of talking about, you had poor health uh, as, a, yeah. as a kid. You had pneumonia. You had open heart surgery. That's a, how, that's a good time for a kid. Well, that was um, and during the first Scream movie, you got accidentally stabbed? <laughs> well, okay, that's a, what What the yeah. fuck? I've been on enough sets <laughs> on both sides. You generally don't have shit that people can hurt each other with. Yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't necessarily that as dramatic as that. I love the hyperbole of how they, you know, press and how elaborate some things can get. But I mean, yes, I had open heart surgery as a, as a kid. Um, um, that's a whole long story and other side of my life for sure. Um, in terms of the scream thing though, you know, Nev comes, it's near the end of the film. She comes out of that hallway closet with an umbrella and she's in the mask. And I had like a pad here because with open heart, they saw your sternum in half and they wire it back together and it's, and the wire never dissolves. It's still there. Isn't so. it incredible? Not anymore. Is that right? Yeah, my dad they, had... Now they, they laser fuse it or something? They go in and... Because my dad had open heart surgery. Oh, the, they, the, the ones where they don't do the full sternotomy, where they just go non-invasively or intercostally or through the femoral where they artery. Don't, yeah, where they don't have to crack your chest. Yeah. Well, that you know, unfortunately, if I have it again, I have to do that. Once you've had it done, you can't do the non-invasives. Sadly, isn't that, and uh, yeah, it's, maybe it's maybe by the time I need it, if I ever do, I'll, I, it'll reach that point. But knock on wood, you yeah, won't. But isn't that incredible on. that they can do that now? Yeah, it's amazing. It's it's absolutely amazing. I met a doctor. He was doing he and his uh, and his uh, other heart surgeon partner friend whatever had a show on TNT, and I forget the name of it, but I had done this series for Spielberg at the time. And, um, and so we were around them sort of press stuff and all this stuff and fascinating surgeons. And one had invented like 15 different patents on things. And he found that ring around the top of the mitral valve. There's like a little capillary that rings the mitral valve and he found a way into it and he can tighten the mitral valve without just going in through an artery. It's crazy, these minds. Crazy. And my, I mean, honestly, I sit here today because people studied and were fascinated and were passionate about that subject. And, you know, God bless them, each and every one, anybody who's willing to give their life to help others. I just, you know. But I di we digress. Yeah. So you're wearing a pad <laughs> and she has an umbrella. <laughs> yeah, she has an umbrella anyway. And she... And, you know, she missed the pad and I didn't, it didn't break. I didn't bleed. There was no stabbing per se, but, you know, not being able to see, she comes out of the closet and hit me above the pad. So a little scary, but no big deal. You had to be like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's in the film. My reaction's <laughs> in the film, according to Wes. Oh, God. He's like, can I have a bigger pad? Yeah, can really. I can I have a stunt double? <laughs> that, oops. <laughs> um, how did you end up? I mean, first of all, you've had an incredibly varied career. Um, and what's so impressive, which people, I think, don't necessarily always understand, you have been a consistently working actor for, what, 30 years yeah, th right around there, 31 years, 30 years, something like that, yeah. Are you ever surprised that the work just keeps coming? Because a I'm working actor... I'm certain that it will, to be honest. It's it's weird. I mean, yeah, there was a stretch where I knew, you know, okay, I can glide for a while and things will be coming. And, and then, but now, I don't know. Who knows? You know, it's such a weird time. It's like, you know... Aging is is difficult on film, you know, and um, I don't know. So I just never know what's coming. And, you know, this was such a blessing to get to, you know, Giancarlo Guest taught the, some of those classes for Mamet years ago. He was doing a play for him. So I've been aware of him for 30 years and and how incredible a performer he is. And and uh, and so this one, though, you know, I auditioned for this one in this kitchen with my daughter and and, you know, it blessed to get to be a part of 
such an incredible ensemble of of actors. I mean, really just blown away. I, I was a, I, I was going to ask how you got Parrish. I'm kind of amazed that you had to put yourself on tape. I would think. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, there, there are things that you read them and you're like, you know, I can understand why if I was on the other side, I, no matter who it was, I would want to hear it, you know, and so I'm not that precious about it, nor have I really been on some, you know, sort of steam train up. Um, I mean, I've, I've worked with great people over the years, but, you know, Riverdale certainly hit the zeitgeist. I mean, it was madly popular. Um, since then, I've done several films with incredible people. Um, they just didn't pop, you know, they just didn't, nobody was really that aware of them for whatever reason. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I stay busy, but there's nothing where somebody would go, oh yes, of course, let's, you know, I, I don't think, I mean, some things for sure. I do get some offers here and there, but, um, but that's part of, you know, that's part of the roller coaster of a career in it. And I mean, you know, I I certainly didn't struggle in the beginning, so I guess it's inevitable that at some point it will, you know, it will test me. Um, oh. We'll have but, coffee sometime about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, you so are perfect for Colin. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting sort of, there's a part of me that is very perfect for that part. Yeah, for sure. Um I felt like, you know, and there was a discussion early on um, about, you know, after they watched the audition and stuff like that. And we had this Zoom call, uh, the director, producer, creator and uh, and the showrunner and I. And he was just sort of like he was such a you know force of like, you know, of energy of like, you know, we can. I, I don't know, your audition gives me this idea and it could be this and this and this and this. And he said, the one thing I know that I feel is that like this guy could walk anywhere through New Orleans in any ward, any parish and be accepted. And and that, that was an interesting thing to start spinning off of. And I and I got into this idea, you know, first of all, the guy lives on a boat. There's no shower on that boat. There's no it looks like maybe there's electricity, but um. And he'd spent 17 years in in the toughest prison in the U.S. So to have any vanity felt wrong. And whatever it is I Colin looks like is what I look like in the morning. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it was fun to kind of let go and just let spirit be the guide. And that connection with Giancarlo just tingled because he's that way. Like he just he's connecting and so just some magical things that occurred you know that that were kinetic that we could just feel between each other that um is part of what that one sentence of him saying i think he's just this and like oh just opened up this world of like this sad tragic comic you know character please tell me that you actually did shower for the sake of <laughs> I did shower daily. I do shower daily. <laughs> I would method, that to method but not powerful. that method. We're in cars too much together in that show. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes place in New Orleans. And from what it seems so far, I'm not done. Um, it's shot basically entirely on location. Yeah. How yeah. much is the city part of the heartbeat of the show? And how long were you actually there? We were there about five months, I guess. Um, and it, it's it's everything. I think it's such a, a piece of it. You know, certainly for me playing a Cajun, like it was, you know, it was it was so much easier than if I was in Vancouver, let's say. Um, you know, it was it was fun to sort of get to know the city. And I have a dear friend who's on the police force there who, you know, I mean, it was the murder capital. I don't know if it still is, but it can be a dangerous city, but it's so alive and it's so, you know, the people are incredible. The music, the food, the architecture, the history, the like every, there's so much in, in New Orleans and to experience. And, and it reminded me a lot of pre-Giuliani New York. 
So there was this sort of like freshness in a way, like I felt almost 20 again for them, you know, which gave an energy to it as well. Um, yeah, it's definitely a big part of the story and a vital part of it. And, and I think the perfect city for it, because it is that sort of working man, every man place. And that's exactly what uh, Gratian Parish is in the show. So you obviously just from this conversation are very, um, I would say, seven eighths method acting and the rest sort of more of the working actor mentality reality show up know your lines hit your marks you know the very sort of structured so how much did you dive in to Colin did you allow and the culture did you go safely into some of those darker neighborhoods did you allow yourself to take the risks as skeet to learn about Colin? Um, no, I didn't do that much. And, and to be honest, I'm really not that method. I do, I do feel the energy around and, and through enough years know how to sort of use it to my advantage or, um, and so there's enough of it, right? I mean, literally things happen outside your door in New Orleans. I know when uh, Brian Cranston was shooting there, that you know, they, he saw someone get killed, like going to set one morning or, so, you know, and like, so there were, I mean, I won't speak for him. That's what I was told. So I, I you know, whether that happened or not, I don't know. You know how this world goes. Urban legend. Supposedly. But anyway, the, I, it's not far-fetched to imagine that happening there. So I didn't really have to go far to sort of feel that, that energy of danger. And I spent a lot of time really sort of getting to know Angola and was interested in how, you know, you could have a cellmate and literally live this close to them and be talking to somebody 30 feet away from you that you can't even see in a very intimate way. And the, the way that sort of body spacing gets muted and so I was really interested in that and how he may stand too close at times or you know just how expression would change through 17 years of confinement like that so that sort of gave me you know I I just started getting into that idea and, and and I don't know that any of it shows to be honest but it sort of it was a part of an in um into his you know, into his brain. Okay, now you just woke up the murder and mayhem part of me. How did you study <laughs> Angola? Did you go? No, I didn't go. I did, I, you know, I, I watched every documentary I could on it. And um, and I know you can go. Um, I wasn't necessarily interested so much in that. I think for me, like the, the only parts that I really, do is like I tend to hear scripts musically And so I heard him and I, you know, and it was clear he was carrying a lot of bass notes. It was a lot of heaviness to what he had to carry with the grief of the loss of his child, everything. It was just, it was low. And so I kind of felt like really to keep the show, because when you first read it and there's the Neville Brothers yellow moon in there. So there's these dark things that happen. And then these pops of jazz, you know, as it should be. But I wanted a character that was staccato and the Cajun accent was perfect for that. So I wanted stuff to just roll. So he had time to delve and sit in those bass notes. And then it, you know, it could just, then the next note is da, 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 da. And then he can, so it, I don't know, it was just a thing I heard. So everything was, is sort of, once I hear it and visualize it, you know, then it's just sort of gearing everything to try and achieve that. You brought up the accent. Um, some actors dread doing accents and some just are like too fucking bad. Like yeah, Sean Connery, yeah. you know, playing a Russian submarine captain <laughs> with a Scottish accent in Hunt for Red October. <laughs> yeah. You know, some of, those are some of my favorite moments. Um, yeah. How, how hard was it to get the accent? Cause you're, it wasn't I mean, hard to be honest. I had really? done it one other time. Um, I did a, uh, a Quibi film with Lawrence Fishburne, and um, and 
Antoine Fuqua was set to direct it, produced it ultimately, and handed it over to Seath Mann, an incredible director. Um, um, but we, you know, I had in talks with him, decided that that character it was set in New Orleans and that I wanted it to feel more like a street where I played this cop who was, you know, his partner was killed by this guy and he, and it becomes this guy and Lawrence Fishburne's story. And, but I just wanted, so I dabbled in that accent and, and wisely they gave me a driver who was Cajun, you know, so I got to really like check it every morning on the way to work. And, and so I, and this was five years ago, so I had a history with it. Um, that made this one even more fun. You know, I was really interested in the musicality of it and and also how this guy survived 17 years in Angola. Like, how did that evolve, That the sound of that accent? But I had, you know, I had lots of people come to me on set who were like, you sound just like my uncle or my family or this and that. My family's Cajun. I feel like I'm at home. All this stuff that sort of gave me like, all right, keep going, keep going. In all honesty, I wasn't really that indebted because maybe a hundred Cajuns will actually see the show and may critique it one way or the other. But it was the tone that I was like really into. Yeah, it's always the cadence. Yeah. I know that when people try and do imitations of my mother, it was such a distinctive cadence that I can do because I've yeah. heard it my whole life. But people always miss the cadence. But you just brought up family. And before we started, you and I both just talked about being empty nesters. Yeah. So you have twins. Yeah. A boy and a girl, a single dad. Yeah. Uh, our children are 23. <laughs> it's it's like, I don't, I can't get my head around being 23 again. I mean, I can. I keep <laughs> saying things like, I get it. I was 23, but from my perspective now, here's what I wish I had done. Yeah. And then I get ignored, that's but that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think we have conversations similar to that and, and having boy girl twins is like having a sociological experiment. Like girls definitely mature three years. I'd, I'd say faster. Um, uh, I think my daughter's actually more mature than I am at the moment. So uh, maybe it's even more than that. Um, isn't it? Isn't it fascinating, like you said, to raise, like people always said to me, when they say, oh, raising a boy is so much easier. I'm like, not necessarily. Girls, you at least know how they're feeling. Because they yeah. come home from school and hurl themselves on the bed and the world is ending. Boys go in their room, shut the door and just grunt at you. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 yeah yeah i mean it's an it's such a god there's nothing better like it's i don't know i i still to this day feel like I, at least i'm the coolest person to two people and um and the love and you know i don't know it's it makes empty nest so difficult and i know it's a necessary part of you know helping raise adults for the world but uh it's hard it's hard to let go and you know then in a way i was sort of you know excited to get to this phase you know as they were in high school and they were never home you know they were always out doing their things and i only worked in la from the time they were born until riverdale when they were 15 and then i was doing like i don't know how many hundreds of flights a season because I flew four times a week for the first two years for 10 months of the year. And, and, you know, I was like, Oh, I can't wait to just be on the road again. And, you know, and go do a movie here, go do a movie there, wherever. And now I'm like, I just wish I could be back home with them. I just, they're <laughs> gone. I, I have to ask one question because thinking yeah. about it just made me giggle. Um, <laughs> I don't know about the kids in your neighborhood, yeah. but the scream mask is always a big Halloween costume. Yeah, isn't it? It's so wild. How did you handle that walking down the street with your kids trick or treating? Go, and that's me, and that's me, and that's they me. They were the ones me. saying it too. Like that's just like, Daddy, that's you. Daddy, that's you. <laughs> I mean, so many people have tried to convince me through the years to wear that on Halloween, and I just can't. Um, 
<clears throat> but it would be fun at some, maybe I should at some point. Uh, that would be hilarious. So yeah. what's, what's next? I don't know. I, you know, there's a, a film I'm really interested in doing in July that, you know, that hopefully will, will happen. Um, um, I garden a lot. I build. <laughs> you are really an empty nester. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I garden. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, I, I, things feel pretty great to be honest. I, you know, the strike was a lot. Um, I feel like we're starting to get our legs back and there's another one looming. So it's been a lot pandemic strike, potentially another strike. Um, so, you know, I haven't worked since we shot this show and it's, it eats me up. I, there's something cathartic about, you know, my job and it's, you know, so fulfilling and, and I love it so much. And I just, I can't stand not doing it. So this year and a half now is eating me up. I get it 100%. Well, luckily yeah. we can watch you on Parish AMC Sunday night, nine, eight central. Yeah, I yeah. can't believe this is the first time we've actually done an interview in all I know that years. is pretty shocking. That is very I, shocking. <laughs> I was like, have I ever actually entered? And I'm like, no, weird. No, no. Well, and it's so lovely. You're so good at it. And I'm I'm glad we finally got the time to do it and, and oh. the reason to do it. And and oh. yeah, we're we're fit and fiddle in terms of the empty nesting and you know. Yeah, and we still think we're cool and young until every morning when you get out of bed <laughs> and your first steps are like, what's gonna hurt today? <laughs> <laughs> right on oh, my back. It's gonna be my back. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure.